All right, welcome back. I uh, would like to talk to you about something that's very important to all of us, and that's our children. And uh, of course, they're our future, and we have a real responsibility to protect our future, and that means protecting our children. I, I want you to know that I'm an expert on this next subject. <laughs> this is my family, and uh, I've had an opportunity to not only be a father of three wonderful and successful and productive children, but I am the grandfather of five children and hopefully more. You know, all those messages I gave my kids when they were teenagers about not doing it? <laughs> well, reproduction, of course, uh, has to do with your ability to, uh, to be fertile. And whether or not you're fertile, I think nature is planned on that accomplishment being directly related to whether or not you're healthy. It makes no sense in survival of the species for the unhealthy, the unfit, to reproduce because the intention is to improve the species. And it has been shown in multiple scientific studies that if you eat well, in other words, you don't eat the rich, high-fat American diet, you're more likely to reproduce. You're more likely to be fertile. And a recent study just published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is uh, the latest that shows for example, men who eat the high fat, saturated fat, and you know what that means, that means dairy and meat, high fat American diet, they have lower sperm counts. The sperm are less modal, they're less effective. I mean, plain and simple, if you're gonna do that to yourself, it's going to be shown in your manliness, and womanliness too. Uh, you are going to be less able to reproduce. Well, why would you expect, why would you expect the organism to act differently? And so those of you who want to have an effective line lineage, you need to take good care of yourself because the healthy survive and the healthy reproduce. And it only makes sense if you understand the reproductive function of the human being that diet would be very important. And one of the most basic things about the human being, particularly the human male, that tells us how to eat has to do with our male anatomy. Our male anatomy is put together such that we make, we make our, our semen, uh, our, which contains our sperm, out of various fluids, and we store that semen in little, uh, uh, little sacs that lie behind the bladder. They're called seminal vesicles. Now listen to me carefully. The human being is the only meat eater that has seminal vesicles. What I'm saying is all other mammals, if they have seminal vesicles, they are carnivores. Excuse me, they are, they are herbivores. No carnivore has seminal vesicles. But the human being has seminal vesicles like all herbivores do, which says to me that we're doing something wrong. If every other herbivore has seminal vesicles, that says we ought to be seminal vesicles, and we're acting contrary to our species, contrary to our male anatomy, which contains seminal vesicles that dictate that we should be plant eaters. The human being is the only meat-eating animal that has seminal vesicles, and it's not that nature made a mistake, it's that we act different than our nature. Let's start with uh, pregnancy. A sec successful pregnancy is diet dependent. One of the scariest things that uh, Mary and I ever did was to change our diet when we were in our pre-reproductive years. Our first two kids, Heather and Patrick, who you've seen here this weekend, uh, we ate a, an improved, uh, let's say a moderate, let's say a reasonable American diet. We started changing our diet before we had kids, but we were still eating range-fed beef, low-fat dairy, Brown rice, certainly brown rice, and uh, after our Mary's second pregnancy, uh, unfortunately she lost the third pregnancy. And at that time we were vegan. We were, going, we were eating a very healthy diet, and I told Mary, or at least we were supposed to be vegan, when she got pregnant with the third baby, she, I said to her, you know, I really think you ought to maintain a vegan diet. Well, Mary was a little uncomfortable with that. You know how the traditional teaching is, you need to eat plenty of meat, plenty of dairy, and so on to have a successful health and a successful pregnancy. So she varied a bit in her diet that we just started and started including animal products in the diet and so on. And about three months into the pregnancy, she had a miscarriage. Now, I don't believe it was the diet, the inclusion of these dairy and meat products that caused the miscarriage, but I do know that it was a lesson for her to realize that 
that it wasn't a guarantee that you could have a successful pregnancy if you included meat and dairy and a well-balanced diet. But still there was this insecurity about being pregnant, having a healthy baby, and not doing what everybody says you need to do and should do. Well, about that time, as I told you on uh, Friday evening, we'd met one of my very important mentors, and that's Nathan Pritikin. And I'd ask him about diet and a successful pregnancy and some way to help him with my insecurity, for him to help me with my insecurities. We're talking about children right after they're weaned, and we're talking especially about pregnant women because it's the best dietary program for pregnant women. It'll get rid of the risks of toxemia, of the many symptoms that you can get along with pregnancy, with the threat of varicose veins, and will give them a much easier delivery because they'll have much better circulation. It must be hard for people who have children and uh, for women who are pregnant to follow that type of advice when so many other people are saying different things. Unfortunately, the advice they get from the dietitians and from their physicians who are treating them during the pregnancy are not based upon sound nutritional experience. They're based upon arbitrary guidelines from the set down and unfortunately they do damage to the pregnant woman. So back then I was given the truth from Nathan Pritikin about uh, how you're supposed to eat well. But it, again, it's a very emotional issue. You can do almost anything with yourself, but when it comes to the unborn or it comes to your, your children, you always, or most people go back to what we know to be tried and true, what everybody says. And then of course if a tragedy does happen, like you have a miscarriage like Mary did, you can at least say I did everything right. You know, if she would have stuck to a very healthy vegan diet, so to speak, that we were attempting to do at that time and she'd lost the baby, then I'm sure her thoughts and my thoughts, at least in part, would be, well, we shouldn't have been eating a healthy vegan diet. Well, because of that miscarriage, it uh, at, least, at least changed her thinking enough so that when, we, when she got pregnant again and we had our third baby who we met, Dr. Craig McDougall, she stuck to a very strict vegan diet. And the way she describes her pregnancy is that uh, at the end of the pregnancy, she was only 15 pounds heavier and her rings fit, which was dramatically different than her first two pregnancies, which she gained a, a lot more weight, suffered a lot more, and a lot of swelling. I believe the best diet there is for a pregnant woman is our diet, which is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Now, as a practicing doctor, I ran into some issues about what the best diet is for a pregnant woman. When I first uh, started in medicine as an intern and an early resident, I took care of pregnant women. I told you of my plantation experience, I caught 100 babies. Uh, back then, the biggest concern of doctors was your patients gaining weight. We would uh, admonish our pregnant patients back in the 1970s for gaining any weight at all. In fact, we went so far as if you gained weight, we'd put you on a diuretic to cause you to lose weight because we knew that being overweight was associated with big babies and bad outcomes. Well, unfortunately, what happened with this strict dietary advice to, to stay very trim, and maybe the efforts we took in terms of adding diuretics complicated the problem. Unfortunately, what doctors soon discovered was when they told women not to gain weight, that the end result was small babies who didn't do well. So as a result, this was in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, the recommendations of obstetricians changed 180 degrees. They could see, well, we tell women to lose weight and the babies turn out poorly and we lose more babies. So that's obviously bad advice. So what we need to do is we need to tell them to eat as much as they want. And that's the current dietary recommendations for pregnant women for fear that we're gonna end up with two small babies that have an increased risk of death. And what's the consequence? When women get pregnant in this day and age, it's almost guarantee that they're going to become overweight. They're going to gain 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds. Now, to me, that makes no, no sense at all. We, we don't have an effective dietary advice if we tell women, don't gain weight, and the babies end up too small with higher risks. Or if we tell them, no, go ahead and eat as much as you want, then the mothers and babies end up too big. What's the problem here? The problem is you can't make... You can't make right out of something so wrong, which is the American diet. If you feed too little of it, you're sick and the baby does poorly. If you eat too much of it, you're sick and the baby does poorly. The only way to fix the problem 
is to fix the food. That's the problem. And then what happens, as has happened to women for whatever you believe, two, three, four million years, 6,000 years, whatever you want to believe, is that women get pregnant, their appetite increases, they eat the food, they have a normal healthy outcome, and so on. The problem is the diet's wrong. And we're never going to fix our problems with pregnancy until we get the diet right. So the norm these days is to not tell a woman to eat, to, eat, uh, to restrict her food. We tell them to eat as much as they want, and the consequences, women end up getting too big. The result of too big a babies is something the doctors call a fetal pelvic disproportion. Fetal, that means fetal, the baby, and the pelvis are out of proportion. There's something wrong with the female. And uh, the result of a fetal pelvic disproportion is you have too big a baby because you ended up eating a lot of food, baby gained weight, you gained weight, and so on, and the pelvis isn't big enough to handle that big baby. I mean, babies, when I was a little baby, and my grandparents and so on in the past, babies used to be five, six, seven pounds. But today, typical babies are eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and sometimes 14 pounds. Well, women are designed with a pelvis, with a birth canal, to fit a baby who's five, six, seven pounds. If you have a 10, 11, 12, 13 pound baby, what happens is you can't fit them through that birth canal. And so you have failure progression of labor. And the consequence of failure progression of labor is often an emergency cesarean section. And so as a result, women are having a high rate of emergency and even planned cesarean sections. In fact, cesarean section has almost become the norm for birth. I mean, you as, as women, as mothers, as grandmothers should be offended by what has happened in medicine today is that you could almost expect a cesarean section. Now, uh, Meek has left. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I will. <laughs> uh, you saw my granddaughter, Chloe, seven months old. Uh, fem uh, Mika is a board certified family practitioner. She got her training through uh, OHSU. And uh, one of the greatest fears she had at the end of her pregnancy was that she was going to get a C-section. She, she was uh, uh, scared to death she was going to get a C-section because she was working with the doctors there and she realized, as a family practitioner, you, you, you worked on C-section, you worked on normal deliveries, she realized her chance of getting a cesarean section was 30 to 40 percent. And so she did everything she could to not enter those statistics. She stayed home as long as she could until the end stages of labor. She got as much support around as she could. She is a doctor. She is educated. She knows about this, and she felt she had to protect herself against the system. There's something seriously wrong here. Fortunately, and, and believe me, it was a close call because, uh, you know, labor is difficult. And in these, this day and age, if you labor it too long, doctors get worried, and they immediately go for a C-section in hopes it's for the benefit of the baby, but in part, it's for their own benefit. They're afraid. This is fear-based medicine. So our cesarean section rate went from, in 1965, 4.5% in 1965 to a C-section rate of approximately 32% in the United States. Now, that's the United States. There are other countries that even have higher cesarean section rates. Like, for example, in Brazil, the C-section rate in private hospitals is over 77%. That's right, having a baby is no longer through the birth canal, it's through the top of the belly. That is almost the norm. And that's because of fetal pelvic disproportion, because we're feeding a diet that can't possibly work, it's the wrong diet. So you either have, you're too small, the baby's too small, or you're too big and the baby's too big. You can't fix the problem until you fix the problem, which is the food. Now, of course, there are other reasons that doctors blame, or that people blame on this high C-section rate. They say it's because women are lazy and don't want to deliver their babies naturally. I don't believe that. And they say the doctors are greedy. I don't believe that's the primary reason. It is more financially rewarding to do a C-section than a natural birth under most systems. And to schedule a baby is convenient for the mother and the doctor. But uh, uh, the, the price paid is huge for mother and baby. If if this was normal for babies to have, or if it was, it just doesn't fit into the evolutionary cycle for, for babies to be too big and mothers not to be delivered. I love this classic paper that was published in 2003 in Obstetrics and Gynecology. The title of the paper is our Dar A Darwinian View of Obstructive Labor. And what Dr. Roy said is, 
evolution is essentially survival of the most reproductively fit. If this was a normal natural thing for women to have fetal pelvic disproportion, for them to be inadequate in delivering babies, those women would have been selected out of the population. This could, this could never happen under normal evolutionary survival terms. It's only because of our modern technology and the diet that forces people to act in this abnormal behavior that this even exists. This is a, a created problem, this high sex section rate, and the only way you're going to solve it is to feed women properly. Uh, <clears throat> the C-section rate has increased and so it has uh, induction of labor. And as a consequence, babies are being born earlier. We schedule C-sections, we induce labor if, uh, you know, if, if uh, it doesn't go exactly as the timetable says. And as a consequence, these days, babies are born seven days earlier than they were in 1992. And if you have an earlier birth of a baby, that baby has more risk of pneumonia, infection, and other problems. So you're bringing the baby into the world too young in, in the gestation. And of course, the other problem that you have with the cesarean section is you have complications of surgery, anesthesia, and the babies that are born through the belly as opposed to the vagina, they miss an important inoculation. And that's with proper bacteria from the intestinal tract. Part of the normal birth process is that for that baby to go from a sterile environment in the womb through the birth canal and to pick up mother's fecal bacteria to properly populate the intestine. When you're born through the top, you get populated with bacteria that are pathogens in the hospital. That's another problem. Uh, earlier birth uh, has changed the mortality of women. For example, in California, in February of 2010, compared to 1996, the death rate of women from childbirth has doubled. And that's a consequence of the early induction of labor and cesarean section that's occurring. Now, these are real life tragedies that are going on in our population. Uh, let's talk a little bit about morning sickness. Morning sickness, people think, is a disease. Women who get pregnant, they're worried that if they're morning sick, there's something wrong with them. Actually, morning sickness is a normal, natural part of being pregnant. In fact, statistics show that women who have morning sickness, they actually have less risk of a baby with malformation and other health problems. It's a normal, natural, uh, natural effect that occurs when women get pregnant in the early pregnancy, and it's a it's, it's a mechanism designed to protect the baby in its early stages of development from environmental toxins. And what this particular paper shows by Dr. Flaxman and Dr. Sherman is that it is a normal protective mechanism, and they identify in their paper that what the mother is trying to protect the baby from is the meat and dairy, which are full of environmental chemicals that are toxic to the young fetus. And Many of you can relate to this, being pregnant in the past, what you naturally gravitated to when you were morning, you suffered morning sickness was things like simple fruits and vegetables, and you had a natural aversion. Most of you, I realize there are some individual differences here. You naturally avoided the animal foods in your diet. The animal foods have environmental chemicals in them that are toxic to the fetus, toxic to adults, toxic to everyone. And the way you get these environmental chemicals mostly in your diet is by eating high on the food chain. Environmental poisons, intentionally or unintentionally, are spread throughout our environment, our oceans, our grasses, our lands, every place. So these things are every place. And what happens is they're fat-soluble chemicals. And so the cow comes along and eats the grasses and the grains. And a few molecules of these environmental chemicals, they get concentrated in the cow's fat because they're fat-soluble chemicals. And they get stored and concentrated. It's called a process of bioaccumulation which biomagnifies the poisons in the environment. And so the cow gets, uh, gets a huge dose because they eat tons of grasses and grains. And even if there's a few molecules per pound, what happens is they get concentrated in the cow's fat. And then the, the, the woman or the man eats the uh, cows as, as their source of calories. And they get much more concentrated doses of these chemicals. And at the end of the food chain is the baby. They get the highest levels of environmental contaminants. In fact, the Environmental Defense Fund in the 1970s, they analyzed breast milk from 46 states for its chemical content, and they declared human breast milk toxic because of the high levels of environmental chemicals. Now, it's only toxic because women are encouraged 
to eat the rich Western diet, get plenty of protein, get plenty of dairy for your calcium and meat for your protein. And as a result, you ended up taking in these huge loads of environmental chemicals so that the woman is toxic and her milk is toxic to the fetus. Now, even if it's toxic to the fetus, women should breastfeed because bottle feeding has so many downsides to it. Uh, let's talk about one of the um, most common recommendations these days because a lot of doctors realize and nutritionists realize that meat and dairy is, is not good, not good for anybody. And so what they rely on, and we've heard this discussion a little bit this week, is they rely on fish as a source of protein and as a source of essential fats. And this is, a, I know, a, a new subject to a lot of listeners is the idea that, that you can't get essential fat unless you eat fish. And the reason that this uh, concept is so prevalent is because of, of marketing. Marketing uses a technique called unique positioning so that uh, the manufacturer takes one thing of, about their product that may be unique, unique positioning, and that magnifies it into the whole story. So that if I say calcium, you say, yeah, milk and dairy. I mean, that's as a result of unique positioning of standard marketing. And if I say protein, you say meat or eggs or poultry, it's because of the marketing techniques that are used. And if I say omega-3, you say fish. Okay, this is all created by industry in, in, a, in the effort to sell. Now remember, I told you this is not a conspiracy. This just happens to be what normal businesses do. You know, automobile company advertises uh, these days how efficient their cars are in getting gas mileage. You know, they may be cars that fall apart or are dangerous to drive around and, and, and automobile accidents is almost certain death, but at least you get good mileage because that's something unique about their car. So anyway, uh, I used to, uh, in my early days, I used to uh, uh, fish, in fact, uh, I used to catch fish by spear. That's a picture of me on my sailboat back when I was a young man. Uh, I used to catch them with uh, hook and line. I used to be proud of this photograph. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, these days I'm ashamed of this. In fact, so ashamed that in my new book, The Starch Solution, I have a chapter titled Confessions of a Fish Killer. I used to be a fish killer. And those of you who have listened to this whole week weekend, you understand why I have the serious concerns and remorse that I have because the oceans are almost dead. And the reason that, one of the reasons they're almost dead is people believe that you have to eat fish to get essential fats. And this has been discussed this weekend. Let's talk about essential fats for a minute. Things are essential because you can't make them yourself. You have to get them in your diet. So we have vitamins, certain vitamins. In fact, vitamins, by definition, they're vital. You must get them from your diet because you can't make these small organic materials anymore. Uh, there are certain amino acids in protein that are essential because you can't make them anymore. And there are certain fats that are essential because you can't make them. The reason you can't make them is because in human evolution what happened is the body had these mechanisms. It goes back even, even earlier than human beings and even earlier than animals. What happens is uh, we lose the ability to make certain things like vitamins, essential amino acids, and essential fats because we have no need to... to maintain the mechanism to make these because they happen to be always in our environment so there's no reason to for the human physiology to keep these mechanisms to synthesize things that you don't need when it comes to essential fats there are two essential fats those are called omega-3 and omega-3 omega-6 fats now a fat is a chain of carbons and each of those carbons connects one to another with a single bond a single connection well, there are certain fatty acids or fats that are, that are missing hydrogens at certain positions on the carbon chain. And wherever there are hydrogens missing, missing, what happens is the carbons, instead of attaching to each other with single linkages, have to attach to each other with double linkages. And we call those double bonds. There are two essential fats known to human beings. They are called omega-3 and omega-6 fats. We must get those from our diet. The thing that's important for you to understand is that only plants can desaturate at the three and six position. No animal can do this. So only plants can make essential fats. And because our environment has always been loaded with plants, 
we have no need to make these. They've always been around. So we have the omega-3 and the omega-6 fats. What fish will do, as will people, is they'll take these basic omega-3 fats, let's just focus on that for a minute, alpha-linolenic acid, alpha-linolenic acid is the basic one, ALA, it's abbreviated, where you have a double bond at the three position. What fish will do, efficiently, is they'll take this basic ALA that's made by plants, and they'll add some extra carbons and some extra double bonds, and they'll make other elongated essential fats called, for example, eicosapentaenoic acid, and another one called DHA. The fish will do that. And people will tell you, and you heard that in this conference, that we need to eat fish because we don't have the ability or we have an limited abil a limited ability to make to elongate this basic plant fat into EPA and DHA. Well, I'm here to tell you that's just not true. Yes, we have a limited ability, but we have an adequate ability to do this so that easily a human being, I'm talking about a baby, I'm talking about a mother, I'm talking about a father, a human being easily can take that basic essential fat made by plants, ALA, easily can elongate it in its body to EPA and DHA without ever missing the opportunity to supply our essential fatty acid needs. And that's what the science says. If you read my book called The Starch Solution, you'll find I put references, superscripts at the end of certain sentences. You'll find some statements have one superscript, others have, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight. When there's an area of controversy that everybody knows something different, I'll take the trouble to add four, five, six, seven references for you to show you that what everybody knows is not necessarily so. And here are the scientific facts to read it. The human being is very efficient at making these elongated fats. Well, it only makes sense. I mean, after all, not everybody was able to live next to an ocean. And yet people evolved very satisfactorily. A fish has another problem. And that is because it's high on the food chain, it accumulates environmental chemicals. One of the most toxic environmental chemicals is methylmercury. And you, when you walk down your supermarket aisle, Safeway, Whole Foods, by law in California, there has to be a warning on the fish, fish section that says that these fish are known poisons and they'll increase your risk of birth defects and other damage. A study done on sushi in New York in 2008 where they went to various sushi restaurants in New York and they analyzed what six pieces of sushi would provide in terms of methylmercury, provided methylmercury levels that are of concern to the EPA and the FDA. So if you have friends that are pregnant or plan to be pregnant and they are wondering where they're going to get their essential nutrients, you must warn them. Nature did not make a mistake. You do not have to eat fish to get your essential fats. And if you make the wrong decision, you're going to poison yourself and your baby. That's what the, the scientific research says. And that's what the governmental warnings state to you, is this stuff is toxic. Now, it's good for the pregnant woman to know this. It's good for her offspring to have this awareness in the family. But it may be the only saving grace for our fish population. People may come to the understanding that this stuff is so toxic now because of the environmental pollution that they will stop eating these fish. And that may be the only reason they're saved. So fish fat also adversely affect the outcome of pregnancy in several other ways. You hear about fish fat. Fish fat, these elongated uh, essential fats, EPA and DHA, they're drugs. They're pharmacologically active drugs. And they change chemicals in your body, hormones in your body, uh, that are known as prostaglandins, and these changes in prostaglandins, they affect your, uh, your outcome of your pregnancy. For example, we know women who, uh, who ha are pregnant in the Faroe Islands, and they eat a lot of fish there, and when they study their pregnancies, what they find is their pregnancies last longer. Their gestation is prolonged, and as a result of prolonged gestation, what happens is the babies get bigger. And when the babies get bigger, they have a harder time fitting out the birth canal. And so they have an increased risk of injury to the baby and also death to the baby as a consequence of consuming this fish fat that's supposed to be so good for pregnancy. So you have an increase in birth injuries and cesarean sections as a result of, a, of consuming this pharmacologically active drug. Uh, there's an increase in infant mortality, and that's, of course, brought out by the Faroe Island studies. 
And the other thing we know is uh, women who take fish oils during pregnancy, they have an increased risk of gaining weight, high blood pressure, other health problems. Uh, this is something that you don't want to do if you are a pregnant woman and want to have a healthy outcome, is don't buy into this, you need this essential fat, because you're buying into a very toxic food. I, uh, as I said, I'm an ocean lover, and uh, in addition, all the wonderful things that you heard this week, and particularly the presentation you heard yesterday morning about the, the environmental catastrophes that are upon us, I wish that that was an exaggeration presented by Dr. Openlander. Uh, the sad thing is, is uh, he's right on the mark. We're in big trouble. One of my favorite things to do is still these days is scuba dive. I've had a chance to take my children to a place that is the most preserved place on the planet for wildlife, for fish life, and it's called Cocos Island. It's 360 miles uh, west of the Costa Rica mainland, and this is a national this is a national park where fish are supposed to be protected. This is one of the scenes that I had from the last time I was there. I had an opportunity to swim with these beautiful animals, which are known as Galapagos sharks. Now, I know that's a little bit scary for you, but it's, I do really strange things sometimes. And uh, since I've been going to Cocos Island over the last 17 years, even though this is a national park, it's protected, I want you to know that 70% of the large animals have been harvested and are gone. One of my dreams is to be able to take my grandchildren to see this same thing that I saw. All right, pregnancy and eating the rich Western diet. One of the major complications associated with pregnancy is something called preeclampsia. It occurs in about 10% of women. What happens is they gain weight, their blood pressure goes up, their kidneys get damaged, they get very sick. But what you need to know is this is not a normal expected part of pregnancy. Pregnancy is supposed to be the ultimate best time of a woman's life. Here you're at in your reproductive prime. Uh, you're carrying on your family name and the species and you know, you should be at your best, but pregnant women are sick women. They not only gain this large amount of weight, they can't deliver their babies, they end up getting high blood pressure and kidney failure and all kinds of problems, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. And one of the best examples of this comes from a study of women in Tennessee. They lived on a, they still do, they have this commune called the farm. And the farm is very much involved in women and pregnancy and children, very conscientious group of people has been around since the 1970s. And when they studied women on the farm who were pregnant, they looked at 775 vegan pregnancies and they found no cases of preeclampsia. They were completely free of this problem. Oh, maybe, maybe one woman, there was a slight suggestion, but otherwise they were free of this. So getting pregnant, it doesn't mean getting sick, but you have to become very conscious of how to eat healthy. They proposed, by the way, that uh, Preeclampsia, or this condition of high blood pressure, swelling, kidney disease, and so on, was due to fast foods. And they proposed the solution in the 1970s for women to eat a vegan diet, in other words, no animal food diet. Another question that's come up is about vitamins. There's a chapter in my new book called The Starch Solution, which says, uh, just to be on the safe side, don't take supplements. These supplements are dangerous. They create nutritional imbalances in your body. See, when you eat food, what happens is the food goes in, and it goes into the mouth, into the intestinal tract, then into the bloodstream, and into the cells in perfect harmony. harmony. Uh, with that morsel of food that you chewed up is some vitamin B, some vitamin C, uh, some vitamin E, a little bit of folic acid, some dietary fiber, some phytoestrogens, a little protein, a little essential fat, and it goes in in a perfect array, perfect orchestration and it goes into your body, into your cells, and then it flows into the cells in a proper amount with proper timing. It works with the cellular machinery and everything is fine. What happens is when you take vitamins, which are isolated concentrated nutrients, you're taking things that are 1,000, 10,000 times as concentrated. They don't have the other vitamins, the other phytochemicals with them, and so these concentrated substances go into your gut, into your bloodstream, flood your cell walls, and create nutritional imbalances that make you sick. As adults, as was brought up uh, last evening, uh, this is not a healthy thing to do, to take these multiple vitamins, at least that's what I wanted to say. It's not a healthy thing to do. And uh, actually the Cochrane reviews show that people who take multiple vitamins, uh, if you look at a million people, there is an increased risk of 9,000 deaths. Uh, in multiple vitamin studies, what it shows is that when you take things like folic acid and uh, the beta carotene and so on, uh, on average, 
in populations. These are well done studies. On average, what happens is you increase your risk of heart disease, death, and cancer by 20 to 30 percent. Why would you expect otherwise? You're creating these nutritional imbalances by taking these supplements. And when it comes to women, it's the same thing. Uh, prenatal vitamins are dangerous for women. 10,000 units of vitamin A retinol is associated with a 1 in 57 chance of having a, a birth malformation, a birth defect in your baby because of the toxicity of this vitamin A. It also results taking vitamin, vitamin substances associated with uh, lower birth weights and congenital heart defects. These are toxic chemicals. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that there's something wrong with vitamins and food. Those are the packages that are supposed to come to you in is in the food, where when you eat the food, what happens is you have this perfect harmony. Vitamins are never toxic in the food. This perfect harmony where these, these elements, these nutrients, they come into your system as they should, in correct balance, in correct amounts. This is, uh, this is hundreds of millions of years of evolution we're talking about that people are trying to change by our uh, entrepreneurial efforts our efforts to improve on Mother Nature. And as in so many ways, and I'm sure you can relate to this in whatever your business in, is whenever we try and improve on Mother Nature, we always have adverse effects. And the adverse effects is a poorer outcome in terms of babies and pregnancy. I do recommend one supplement on our diet for pregnant women, and that's vitamin B12. It's a long story. It may go down to the fact that we are much more hygienic than we used to be in the way we live. Your risk of B12 deficiency is extremely small. As far as a disease is concerned, it's less than a one in a million. But I have to say, this is the, the last bastion for those, of, those people out there that want to condemn a healthy diet. They already know that you can't become deficient in calcium or protein or amino acids or essential fats. There's no argument. They won't even come on the stage about that. So the last thing they're arguing about is, well, you don't get enough B12. Well, OK you don't get enough B12. So what I recommend is that if you are pregnant or nursing a baby or you're on the diet, I recommend for more than three years, it takes 20 to 30 years to run out of B12, and there may be increased needs for a pregnant woman or a nursing woman, that you just add a supplement of B12. As far as I know, it's not toxic. And it's a very safe, inexpensive thing to do. Just add a supplement of B12. And then you'll get rid of the naysayers. Then they have no argument. Then they can say nothing negative about your diet. And I have recommended in all of my career for the last 35 years, in all books, in all DVDs, I've made this one recommendation. If you're going to follow the diet I recommend or any other vegan diet that you add a non-animal source of B12, get rid of the arguments, get rid of the tiny risk. And I do recommend that with some sincerity. Children, okay, the baby's born. The problem is, is our kids are sick. In our society, children are sick. The diseases of kids. They suffer from acne and allergies and inflammatory arthritis like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and asthma and little kids, as was brought up last evening, little kids have already got artery disease. In a study in New Orleans, by two years of age, 100% of the kids already showed fatty streaks in their arteries. And as you get older, what happens is these fatty streaks come and turn into severe blockages. A Korean War study where they looked at their soldiers, about 77% of them had significant or obvious atherosclerosis in their arteries, and the average age was 22 years old. The kids' arteries are already sick. You, you know, some of you know my story. When I was 18 years old, I had a massive stroke as a consequence of eating the rich Western diet. Kids are sick. They're having heart attacks. They're having strokes. Bloody stools, body odor, high cholesterol, colitis, constipation, diabetes. It used to be we called type 1 diabetes, childhood diabetes. We don't call it childhood diabetes anymore. It's because the most common form of diabetes is now related to obesity, which is type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Uh, hemorrhoids, hypertension, indigestion, leukemias, lymphomas, obesity, oily hair, oily skin, ear infections, uh, menstrual problems in our young teenage girls, precocious puberty and testicular cancer are some of the, just a few of the consequences of feeding the rich Western diet to children. Let's talk about precocious puberty for a minute because this is something that should uh, bring our nation to its knees, should bring parents to outrage is what's happening to our little kids. This study was published in uh, November of 2012 in the journal Pediatrics. What they did is they looked at the onset of maturity of little boys when they developed uh, testicular growth and pubic hairs. 
And what they found is little boys who are supposed to mature around 70 to 20 years of age. That's when you're supposed to start thinking of having a family. That's when you're supposed to get on with your adult life when you're 17 to 20. What they found is that the onset of puberty in little boys has decreased to around 9 to 10 years of age. This is a crime against our society. And that was in uh, just the recent pediatrics. There was one prior in little girls in 1997 that showed that little girls, the average onset of puberty, in other words, when they're supposed to start families and they have babies, has reduced from 16 to 19 years of age to now little girls are going through puberty at eight and nine years of age. 3% of the black girls in our society are going through puberty at age three. Eight, 50% of black girls in our society are going through puberty at age eight. Now think about this. What is it doing to your kids, to your family, to society, when you take little children who are not supposed to have sexual desires or reproductive functions until they're adults, and you give them sexual desires or reproductive functions five, six, eight years earlier than they were intended to have them? You know how strong sexual desires are. You know how much it dominates your thinking. What happens when you give this to little kids, these kind of feelings and the abilities? What happens is your little kids aren't thinking about riding bikes and playing checkers and reading books. They're thinking about sex at 8, 9, 10 years of age. It, it, it is a, the result is earlier initiation of sexual activities, more teenage pregnancies, more poverty for women, more complications of pregnancy. You wonder why our society is in chaos and your kids are in trouble and the things that are going on. This is a major factor. When are kids supposed to be mature? We have historical records on when children are supposed to mature. For example, in studies done on little girls, it's really easy to tell when a little girl matures because she starts to bleed. Menarche, it's called. And studies in Norway, for example, in 1830, little girls began their first period when they were 17. Now they begin their, in 1950, they began their first period at 13. In Britain, in the last 150 years, the onset of maturity of little girls has gone from 17 to 13 years of age. In the United States, the first period started around 14 years of age in 1990, but in 1960, it was around, it was a year later, 13 years of age. I think some of the most interesting studies come from Japan. In 1875, little girls be, started their first period when they were 16 and a half years old, 1950, right after the war, when they changed from a rice-based diet to an animal food-based diet, they started the menstrual periods around 15, and by 1960, they were menstruating. Their menstruation started, uh, fell from 1960, from 14 years of age to 12 and a half years of age. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, the latest onset of maturity that I found in little girls was 19 years of age. In Papua New Guinea, in the Central Highlands, their diet is 92% of the diet is sweet potato leaves and roots. All right, so what's the problem? Why are kids sick and why are they maturing early and why is the result the chaos in our society? Well, you know what it is, folks, it's the sugar. You know, Mark Bittman said this a couple of days ago in an op-ed piece. He said, he told us the problem, folks, is the sugar. And that's what we're focusing on. I'm here to tell you that this is a scapegoat to take people's attention off what really is going on. Sugar is not health food. And don't miss this statement because people will come back and say, McDougall recommends sugar. That's not true. No, we allow a little bit of sugar in the diet to make it taste better so that the starches go down easier. You know, a little sugar to make the medicine go down easier. But we, we recommend that. But clearly, sugar uh, promotes tooth decay. It raises triglycerides in sensitive people. And it's empty calories. There's no protein, vitamins, minerals, nothing. It's just simple sugar. It's not what we recommend. But to blame sugar on the epidemic of illness we have in either adults or children is a scapegoat. It takes focus off of what the real problem is. The real problem is this. It's the animal foods that we're consuming. It's the eggs and the meat and the dairy and so on. It's the animal foods. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about this. This is the hottest topic in the news these days is sugar's the problem. We've got to solve the sugar problem, which takes attention off of the real problem, which is this problem. And I uh, ran across something recently that will really focus this on you. It was uh, a, a discussion of sugar being the cause of obesity versus dairy products. 
Now, the dairy industry has told us over the last 30 years that the way to lose weight is to consume milk. Well, it, you know, not just milk, you can consume ice cream or yogurt and cheese and so on. That's the way to lose weight. Why does the dairy industry tell us that? They realize that obesity is a major problem in this country, so they just want to get in on the business. And so they made recommendations like this one in Parade Magazine that says, you're watching your weight, look at your refrigerator. Well, these days what they say is, no, no, that's not the problem. It's not the dairy foods what's the problem. What you need to do is not look at the dairy foods as the weight problem. Look at dairy foods as the solution to the weight problem. Instead, you must look at sugar as the cause of obesity in this country. I'm here to tell you that's not the case. You know, this was me five years ago, and it's still me. As I confess, I'm a waistline watcher from way back. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice cold Coca-Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Mmm, another thing, the cold, crisp taste of Coke is so satisfying, it keeps me from eating something else that might really add those pounds. Coke's a natural, wholesome blending of pure food flavors. I guess that's why everyone likes the refreshing new feeling you get, only from not-too-sweet Coca-Cola. And no wonder, lively, lifty Coca-Cola provides a welcome bit of quick energy between meals. Makes for a pleasant pause in a busy day. Oh, and remember, Coke is low in calories, too. Say, now, don't you get any thinner. Okay. Now, now I know you're sitting here thinking that I've lost my marbles. <laughs> But I want to make a serious comparison for you as to what's going on. The focus of attention is on sugar. In fact, Coca-Cola has really gotten, in, gotten into the headlines uh, recently about this being the problem. I want to tell you that's just, just a way of uh, taking the focus off what the real problem is. Remember, the dairy industry has advertised dairy products as a way to solve America's obesity problem. And they're telling you that sugar is the real problem. Let's just compare for a minute the consequences of consuming a glass of milk versus a Coca-Cola. And again, please, don't think that this message is to tell you that your kids should be drinking Coke. The message is to give you a comparison so you can make some real-life decisions on what's going on. Uh, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. That's just the way the body works. Is if you eat fat, it's destined for your hips and your abdomen. It's from my lips to my hips is the old saying. The body just moves it. And what do we have? Milk is 50% fat. Low-fat milk is 30% fat. Cheese is 70% fat. There's no fat in Coca-Cola to wear. Sugar is converted to body fat only with great effort. What your body does when you eat sugar is it will burn it as calories. It's the most efficient source of calories. It takes two pounds, stores it as glycogen, and any excess, it burns it off as heat or as non-exercise activity. The body does not convert sugar into fat under usual circumstances. You can make it happen, but you really have to force feed somebody large amounts of sugar and require very little activity. So, sugar is not converted into fat. Remember that Coke is 100% sugar and fat is in dairy foods. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Sugar is appetite satisfied. In experimental studies done on people to look at what satisfies their appetite, what they find is when you feed people either sugar or fat, that their appetite is satisfied by sugar, just as Connie Clausen told you. It's appetite satisfied. Whereas when you eat fat, the body doesn't even notice it. As a result, you just keep eating the fat and eating the fat and eating the fat. It keeps getting stored and stored and stored. There's virtually no feedback. The body is not designed to feed back for the fat calories you consume. It feeds back and tells you you're satisfied, your hunger is satisfied, based on sugar, on carbohydrate. Of course, sugar used to be rice, corn, potatoes, fruits, and vegetables. Now it's concentrated sugars. But still, the message is there. Coke is low in calories compared to milk. I mean, Coca-Cola has 97 calories per glass as opposed to milk at 146 calories per glass. And Coca-Cola is missing all the other negative aspects that I'd like you to focus on a minute when it comes to dairy. Dairy is loaded with allergy and autoimmune disease-causing pro disease proteins, uh, full of poisonous environmental chemicals. Remember, it's high on the food chain, so it's loaded with these chemicals. It's full of artery-clogging, saturated fat, and cholesterol. It causes precocious puberty and obesity in our kids, and it's loaded with infectious agents like leukemia viruses and mad cow prions and listeria bacteria. So the message I'm trying to give you is when you're evaluating how to feed your kids and what the problems are, 
clearly, I'd rather have you feed your kids Coca-Cola than a glass of milk. The science is solid. Unfortunately, the business is different. All right, how to feed kids properly? Well, a uh, baby should be breastfed. That's the normal, natural way. And unfortunately, if you fail to follow that normal, natural way, you and the baby pays significant consequences. Uh, Bottle-fed babies have an increased risk of SIDS, crib death. They have uh, a 60 times greater chance of pneumococcal pneumonia in the first three months of life compared to a breastfed baby. 60, they saw my little granddaughter there. You know how confident I feel because she's a breastfed child. The risk of hospitalization is 10 to 12 times greater in a bottle-fed baby than a breastfed baby. Problems of, uh, of speech, of uh, oral development, all kinds of difficulties when you bottle-fed a baby as opposed to breastfeeding. But sometimes there are problems when it comes to breastfeeding. There are some mothers who can't. And then you ask, well, what do I do? Well, the ideal thing would be to do what's normal and natural in society, that is you hand the baby off to your sister or to your best friend. But in our society, that's close to pornography to do that. That's how bizarre our behavior is. We'd rather sacrifice the health of the child than to do something like share human breast milk between families. And th that's, that's unfortunately the way it is. So we're left with, what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, consume uh, milk from a breast bank, breast milk bank? And that's one possibility. And that's a question that's come up in my professional and personal life, too. What do you do if you have a, a mother who can't breastfeed the baby? Do you feed breast milk donated by other women in the community that you can buy at this breast, breast milk bank? I've thought about that seriously as a thing to do. I don't recommend it, except under the most restricted circumstances. And I'll tell you why I don't recommend it, because that milk is dirty. 60% of a woman's pesticide content is dumped into her milk during the first six months of lactation. The milk is dirty. And these women who are donating milk, you know, bless them for, for their sacrifice. But unfortunately, they eat the rich Western diet and their milk is dirty. So what are you going to do? What's, what's the next option? Well, it's formula. What kind of formula do you feed? Do you feed soy-based formula that has these estrogen chemicals? Or do you feed cow-based formula that has a high rate of autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes? What do you do? Well, the best, the best alternative I've been able to offer is to feed uh, what we call hypoallergenic cow-based formula. There are protein hydrolysate formulas. What they do is they take cow-based formula, they grind it up chemically, they denature the amino acids so that you don't have autoimmune reactions to them, and then they put it back in the formula, and they sell it in the grocery store and in the drugstore as uh, various hypoallergenic formulas. There's some names of them. But the problem is these formulas taste terrible. The kids won't drink them. And the reason they taste terrible is because they have such a low sugar content. If you take one of these hypoallergenic formulas and compare it to the standard formula the same company makes, you compare the sugar content, you see the sugar content of the standard formula is higher. It tastes sweeter. I have to believe, and I know it's my cynicism, that somehow the, the formula-producing companies have figured out it's not really as profitable to sell these hypoallergenic formulas. So we'll just well, make them taste as good as our high-profit line. Well, you can fix all that. If you have this situation, you can't breastfeed, you don't know what to do, what I would do is I would choose one of these hypoallergenic formulas, look at the sugar content of the formula, compare it with the regular formula that sits side by side, look at the difference in sugar content, and just add a little sugar to the formula. The kids love it. You just bring it up to the regular sugar content of the regular formula. Just by adding a, a quarter teaspoon of simple sugar to two ounces of formula, the kids love it. And then they're getting the safest of all the formulas. All right, feeding kids. Well, kids are just like, they're little adults. They really are after two years of age. After two years of age, the intestinal tract is mature. The teeth work well. There's no reason to have breast milk after two years of age. You can, no problem. A child should be exclusively breastfed for six months of age. Then at six months of age, they develop teeth and hands that are coordinated to reach out and grab whatever's in mother's arms in terms of food. That's the time you introduce solid food. And as time goes on, the kids become more efficient at utilizing solid food. The solid food intake increases. The breast milk decreases about two years of age. It can happen earlier, or you can wait till later. That's the time when the child can easily be switched to solid food. They have a mature intestinal tract. So that's the way you feed kids. I would start out with starches like rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Mashed would be a good place to start. It's various cereals. 
feed them some fruits. They like fruits. Vegetables are a little bitter. It may be hard to get the vegetables down. So you can add those a little bit later. That's the diet of a child after weaning and the full diet after two years of age. One of the problems that people worry about when they feed kids a vegetable diet is they're going to be too little. And feeding the rich Western diet because it's loaded with fat and calories and so on, they grow bigger. And big is worshipped in our society. Big is better. But big isn't necessarily better. Let's just talk about tall. If you happen to be a tall woman compared to a short woman, you have four times the risk of getting breast cancer. You have double the risk of colon cancer if you're a tall person as opposed to a short person. Tall people live less long than short people do. Overnutrition kills. Now, you can relate to this. If I ask you to think about history a little bit, you remember when you went to the museum and you saw the armor from the knight. It was about that tall, wasn't that, that knight's armor? And you went and you saw George Washington's bed in the museum, and it was like that, about that big. People used to be smaller, but smaller was normal. What we suffer from today is exaggeration of growth due to the rich Western diet. All right, so you're not going to buy that, and you want to have bigger kids, I understand. Uh, it's easy. All you do is you feed them adequate number of calories, an abundance of calories during their puberty years. They'll grow just fine. You saw my kids. All three of my children are here this weekend. Now, I, I'm six foot tall. Craig's six one. Patrick's six four. You know, Mary's five five. Heather's five six. They were raised on this kind of diet. You just feed them an adequate amount of calories. They grow just fine and healthy too. All right, then we have the problem as the kids get older, they uh, start on with their life and whatever career they go into, one choice they may make is the military. The sad thing is today that uh, estimates go from somewhere to 20 to 80% of our kids are unfit to serve in the military. They're too fat and sick. And in the military, 54% of the military personnel are overweight. I mean, we're asking these brave men and women to defend us, and we send them out on battle lines fat and sick. There's a real injustice here. And there's a threat to our national security doing this. All right, so you're trying to peel your kids. You say, well, you know, if you eat good, you won't get breast cancer. So what, mom? Uh, eat good, you won't get a heart attack. Oh, I'm never going to have a heart attack. You eat good, you won't get fat. Well, that could be an important issue. What do kids appeal? What are they uh, concerned about? Their personal appearance. I remember when I was a teenager, you know, one pimple ruined the day. <laughs> well, acne's caused by eating the high oil, high dairy American diet. It's 100% curable with a healthy diet. Appeal to them for their greasy skin, for their fatness, and their personal attractiveness in terms of body odor. If you eat animals, you stink like animals. <laughs> appeal to them for things like that. And, and it may require you to talk about uh, something else that's important to children, particularly in their teen years, is their ac athletic prowess, their ability to, to, to compete and win in sports. And uh, tell them that this is the way to win in sports is to eat a healthy diet. Well, let's ask to Nathan Pretty. I think it's time to demonstrate that this dietary program is not just for sick people. And because of that, I was in, at Kona, in a large island, on October 9th for the triathlon. That's the very substantial endurance contest. I think it's the world's. Uh, greatest effort in the way of an endurance contest. Almost a two and a half mile swim in the open ocean, a 112 mile bike ride, and then a 26 mile marathon, all together. They all run back to back, and the world's record is just a little over nine hours. And uh, I sponsored six athletes in the contest uh, October 9th to demonstrate that there is no dietary program in the world that can give the kind of endurance that a high carbohydrate of natural foods uh, diet can give. And of the 850 entrants, the number one, two, three, and four place winners were among my six that I sponsored. So, so, so tell the kids, tell the kids that of the, of the winners in long distance Olympic events, the runners since 1968, they've all been Ethiop Ethiopians and Kenyans who live on corn and other vegetables. If they want to win at their uh, activities in sports, they need to be fueled properly. Appeal to them on things that really count. All right, so you know, my level of frustration has been high and my efforts I consider you know, substantial in trying to change things. I've really tried to resort to 
uh, going through government to make changes. Government's job, as I told you, is to protect us from foreign domestic threats. Well, the food industry is a domestic threat. And so uh, the food industry has uh, made efforts to legislate sickness in our society. For example, House Resolution 84, which was uh, done by a, uh, a Senator Loomis, and she is uh, from, where is she from? Idaho? Okay. She made this proposal, which is still active, House Resolution 84, and that is that we are to legislate to our children uh, a government action uh, that most people ages nine and older should eat five to seven ounces of protein foods each day. She's a cattle, cattle rancher. And uh, <clears throat> what the resolution asks is the House of Representatives recognizing the importance of animal-based proteins as a component of a balanced diet of most individuals in the United States and encourage the Department of Agriculture to continue to pro promote the health benefits and consumption of animal-based foods. So the industry is fighting back. They're going to legislation. Well, I'm going to legislation too. Uh, House Bill uh, 609, which was just introduced a couple of months ago, which was to require that the state of Hawaii feed one day a week a vegetarian option to the students in Hawaii. It failed. Yeah, the, the, so far they beat us on that. I have also been involved in legislation recently to try and get doctors to understand human nutrition. Do you believe doctors know nothing about what the human being is supposed to eat? A serious flaw in our medical education. And so I went to the legislature in uh, early of 2011 with Don Forrester. Dr. Forrester was right there with me to get this uh, particular law passed, which was SB 380. SB 380 in the state of California would require doctors to learn about human nutrition. It requires a law to get doctors to learn on human nutrition. I want you to know after Dr. Forrester's and my efforts, this bill introduced February 15, 2011, was passed unanimously by the Senate in May of 2011, passed unanimously by the Assembly in August 2011, and signed by Governor Jerry Brown. It is now a law. SB 380, the doctors must learn about human nutrition. Now, unfortunately, it hasn't gone into a real full swing in activity yet, but we're still working on it. Uh, just two months ago, we introduced SB 608 in Hawaii. I'm a Hawaii licensed physician in addition to California. And SB 680 requires that doctors learn about human nutrition. And when I, uh, when I gave my written testimony to the Senate, of Hawaii, I said that the following things need to be done. First of all, we need to legislate John Burns School of Medicine, their medical school in Honolulu, that will require them to teach dietary therapy to the students. Right now, they learn nothing about diet. Second, we must require continuing education classes for doctors. In other words, if you're a doctor in Hawaii, just like it should be in California, which is what I originally tried to get passed, you cannot get relicensed unless you take a 14-hour course on human nutrition. They do the same thing for end-of-life care, uh, for uh, narcotic use in patients, for AIDS education. Same requirements are, are passed in multiple states around the country. It's not unusual that doctors must uh, get continuing medical education to get relicensed. I think we should have a lot, such a law. And I tried in California. I got part of it passed. Now we're trying in Hawaii again to force physicians to learn about human nutrition. I also, in my testimony, I said, uh, uh, doctors need to be rewarded financially for teaching diet and lifestyle. Right now, they're penalized, as Dr. Forrester talked to you about. And we need an expert committee. I'm sure a lot of you are confused by all the evidence here and all the things you've learned. Hopefully, you're, you're leaving with a, a general direction that tells you we've got serious problems and there are some answers. But we need expert committees to evaluate the data, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of various therapies. And we need to communicate those findings honest findings to the public, to our medical doctors, so that we can change the world. So we have SB 680, which is still active. As a matter of fact, it was passed unamended, um, unamended about 12 days ago by the Hawaii Assembly, unanimously passed, that will require physicians in the state of Hawaii to learn about human nutrition. All right. Uh, I'm going to kind of wind down here a minute. I've been at this for a long time, and I want to share with you an honor I got in November of 2012. Is I got an honor of commendation from the senators, the state of Hawaii, signed by all the senators, for the efforts that I made in Hawaii. And I really appreciate that. Not necessary, but it's nice to know that a difference is being made by myself and all of you in terms of uh, the health in this country. And, and I, 
I'm going to continue as long as I have breath, and I hope you do too. And I want you to know something came out today that you might want to pick up at the newsstands, and that's a USA Today magazine called The Ten Best Diets. Just came out today. Okay? And uh, guess what? We are making progress. Thank you. We are making progress. As uh, many of our speakers, as many of our speakers have said, particularly John Aberson, is what this weekend does is provides a forum, so we don't feel like we're alone. So we can talk to each other. We can we can make an effective effort against the wrong that's being done. And it's terrible wrongs that are being done against our population on our planet. Standing together, we can change this. We are right. We have everything behind us be except for the money. But I believe the truth can overcome the money. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We're going to go have some lunch now. We'll get back, to back together in a few minutes. Thank you.